So if you were to ask me, who is your favorite woman in history? I would say without hesitation, Madame du Pompadour. So you may know her from the episode of Doctor Who, the girl in the fireplace episode with David Tennant, personally my favorite doctor. Madame du Pompadour, you look younger every day. She was great in that episode. Um, just the fact, just a really fun aside, the dress that Sophia Miles wears is actually the same dress that is in the movie The Madness of, of King George. You think I fear you, but I do not fear you even now. So back to the real Madame du Pompadour. She was this amazing Renaissance woman who was like good at everything. So she was, um, She's an actress, she's an artist, she was talented, she was witty, she designed her own dresses, and she was apparently really funny and apparently like the world's nicest human being. So um, she becomes a king's mistress in 1745 when she first meets him, and she actually managed to keep this really coveted position until 1764, 19 years of keeping the king's attention. Now. Even though she's this amazing symbol of beauty and sex, um, she really wasn't sexually active with um, King Louis for a very long time. She apparently had some sort of condition that made sex really painful for her. So she, the physical portion of their relationship died down around five years after. But he loved her so much. He loved her because she was so smart and funny and happy and that they were just like really good friends and he would just go to her chamber and she would amuse him with stories and plays and um, different ideas on how to like refurbish and refurnish like homes. So she was a patron of the arts. Um, she was designed and commissioned beautiful architecture, paintings and porcelain. Um, she was, she's really often compared to the minister of the arts by modern historians today. And I think that's a really good way to put it. The best part of all this is she wasn't even born to this world. She was middle class. Um, she, she died a duchess, but she was actually born to two Parisian commoners um, as Jean Antoinette Poisson. Um, I'm going to put that in here because I don't, I, again, I'm butchering that. I, all my French viewers are probably really mad at me and you really should be. Please feel free to comment in a, below about why I'm, how I'm saying it totally wrong. So, you know, a commoner who rose to be the champion of the arts and earned a title and the heart and ear of a king, you know, you can see why she's my hero. Like, I mean, man, how awesome is that? So actually, if you ever look at my downstairs sewing room, you'll notice that there's a mural on there. Right now it's the swing. And um, that was like this close to not having been there. The other one I was going to put on my wall was this painting of Madame du Pompadour by Boucher. And um, the reason the swing won out is because I love that the swing is just a little naughty. And by naughty, I mean like a lot naughty. Um, and because of that little like insinuation, I just, oh, I love it so much. It lost a Fragonard, but you know, I've been meaning to make it for years and years. Um, the problem with it is that I just haven't been brave enough. I just always felt like I wasn't good enough to make it. And it's one of those paintings that's so famous that if I got it wrong, I felt like people would just make fun of me forever. Um, and then... American Duchess a few months back made this video about just the stress and you know she analyzed the crap out of it it was amazing so um, if you have a chance watch that video she just goes into it and she describes everything and like I didn't know the bows in the front were called shells and I'm again butchering that sorry um, but they're called shells and she there's seven of them she talked about different ruffles ah it's amazing so for that reason I was like you know what Christine just suck it up, make it, and if you get it wrong, everyone on the internet is going to make fun of you forever and ever, and that's okay because you tried. And that is the name of the game. It's not I succeeded, it's I tried. So at least that's for me. And you know, if you've seen my uh, sleepy hollow dress, you know I'm willing to make a dress a lot of times to get it right. <laughs> So if I don't like this one, there's a really good chance that in three years you'll see me try again, and that's okay. So having said that, um, I decided to just go for it. 
I have been trying to figure out the best way to make a robot la francaise like for years and years. Um, I finally decided that my there is no good one pattern that does everything. American Duchess has a robot la francaise pattern with simplicity, and I think that's the best one out there commercially. Um, the back is a little puny for me. It uses it doesn't have that wide of a full dress circumference. I think that all the way around for a really full looking robe la francaise it needs to be about 164 inches um to 180 inches um that one's only about 110 at least for the size that i am so it seemed a little puny to me um it's not quite as full and as lush as i like it so for the back i actually use the i actually use the jp ryan pattern the jp ryan pattern has a great back um it uses these two pleats on the far right that are underneath the rest of the Watteau pleats because those that's what the pleats on the back are called. So there's two pleats under the rest of them as opposed to just one pleat. And they're fairly big pleats, as you can see from the pattern. So you do those pleats on the right and then you do the other pleats on the towards the center and then you kind of smush it all together and then you make the back pleats and they're my favorite part. Then you, using tiny, tiny little stitches, you stitch down about the top anywhere from three to eight inches from the top of it. And that kind of makes that long flowing cape in the back that makes the dress so distinct. Then you still sew down the back um, along the middle and along the uh, along the outer edge so that this part along the sides is still nice and taut while you have those flowing pleats in the back which just go after you like when you are walking in a robe a la francaise you just feel like royalty i think of all the gowns on the planet they are my favorite gowns to wear because i just feel so like majestic um, then for the front of the dress, I actually don't use the JP Ryan because hers makes a very straight single piece front, which actually is not that flattering to my body in particular, I don't think. My red dress is made by that, but the, um, but instead of the front going down in like a triangle, it goes down in two straight lines, which I don't really like that much. So so from there on, I use the American Duchess method of making the sides and the front. To do this, if you look at the book, they have a really great section on how wide to cut the front panels and to cut a wedge in it to first um, add more fullness to the bottom of the skirt while taking away fullness from the top of the skirt. And after you do that, I serge the edges of this, sewed it together, and then I, again, surged all the edges. <laughs> I use my um, Baby Lock Victory serger for this. It's really fast and convenient. So after surging all that, I sewed it together and then I sewed it to the sides of the back of the Watteau pleated section that I had just shown you. And then I pleated it um, about four pleats on each side, all the pleats pointing to the center of the side, which also allowed me to put a little pocket slit there so that I could have pockets so that I could keep camera, water, and booze in my pockets for the next time I go to Versailles in this beautiful gown. After the sides of the skirt were pleated and then machine sewn on, I use a soprano, um, it's a baby lock soprano if anyone's curious about the machine I use. It's just a very nice functional machine that also does very clean buttonholes. Then I put on the top panel and to do so I just use tiny little pinprick stitches again. After that, I used the 18th century method of putting in sleeves as detailed in the American Duchess book to put in the sleeves. If you um, don't have the American Duchess book and want to sew 18th century, I highly recommend them. They have some really, really cool tricks in there that make sewing 18th century really easy. So the sleeves are in then. And after that, I then just cleaned up the edges by hemming everything that I could. Madame de Pompadour was such a renaissance woman because she was clearly a very curious person. She actually spent time learning new things. For instance, even though she could just commission something, she took the time and lessons to learn actual engraved printmaking with Boucher. And these prints survive to this day. 
They're so good that people argue whether or not it was actually done by her, even though it clearly states that these were her prints. Now, while we don't have Boucher to teach us gem cutting and engraving, I would like to take this moment to talk about today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning program where you can watch thousands of lectures from incredible professionals and artists in order to discover how to do different things in a wide range of fields, from illustration, fashion photography, to creative writing, and more. For instance, I'm currently taking two different classes right now, one on how to use After Effects to do awesome special effects like this, and another taught by the Instagram famous Seb Lester to do beautiful calligraphy so I can totally power up my journaling game. The best part, these classes are often broken down into short 7 to 15 minute segments so that I can just improve myself by taking a single lesson a day. Skillshare is incredibly affordable at less than $10 a month with an annual subscription and is really easy to join up. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Now, back to trimming this gown. The dress portion was done, but that's like 20% of making this. The rest is trimming it, which takes forever and ever and ever and ever. So yeah, I would say that sewing the dress up between the Watteau pleats, the hand sewing, making the lining, um, pleating everything, hemming the skirt by hand because that's what, you know, that's what you do. And then you, that takes like 40 hours. I'd say trimming it took about another 100 hours. So to trim it, um, I use a method called pinking. Now, um, pinking is where you get a very sharp metal tool. I use a pinking iron. By the way, if you know someone who makes pinking irons and sells them, please please link me below. I am looking for more pinking irons. I think I know like 50 people who are looking for pinking irons. So you get a pinking iron and then you hammer it and you hammer it and you hammer it. And um, you I hammer it on top of um, magazines because I find that the paper takes it really well. And then um, you do that across. So you do um, and so you hammer it. The pinking cut actually cuts the fabric and it cuts it in such a way that it really doesn't fray. Like I'm showing you right here, um, me like fraying it, trying to fray, but it takes quite a bit to fray it. Again, this depends on the silk. I am using this silk taffeta from Elegant Fabrics um, on Etsy. They are a distributor for Scalamandre. So this is a thicker, more expensive and very lush silk taffeta that's really strong and densely woven. This does not fray that much. And if you look at historical silks, that's how they were done as well. They were very, very tightly woven. So if you pinked it, it just didn't fray. Like 200 years later, they're, they're pinked. They're not actually sewn like that and they're still not fraying, which really tells you a lot. Um, if you use, say, a cheaper silk, um, try it out with a pinking iron first before you buy too much because a lot of them will fray so they will not be good for pinking if you can't afford a really densely woven silk because they are more expensive my suggestion is use a little bit of fray check to clean the edges so that even after you pink it it doesn't fray if you um however fray check does t tend to like change the color a little bit i find that you know people don't usually notice and if they do they're they're being jerks ignore them. But again, if they, if you, if it really bothers you, I heard really good things about gun, gum Arabic and I have not used it myself personally, but I hear it doesn't change the color. Maybe that works. I don't know, but, um, that is always an option as well. I pinked it. Then I hand ruffled it. The way that I ruffle it is I fold it in half and the middle on the wrong side, I use a whip stitch and I gather it. And I kind of did that. Then afterwards, I f open it up, iron it flat, and then I sewed it down. Um, and I did the green first. I did the same with the lace. I actually used a serger to make my lace that was too wide to narrow it down in certain points. Like on the bodice, I wanted to use a, a thinner lace. And if you're not really sure, like look at the painting really closely, you will notice that there is lace. I bet you the lace she used was a lot sheerer than mine, but I got this beautiful um, antique Nottingham lace and I got way too much of it. I got 50 meters of it. <laughs> I probably used like 15, but it's okay. I haven't, I, 
I have enough for the next two attempts at this dress. For the flowers, I'm not really sure what the original flowers were. Part of me wants to think that they were real because like she could afford it. How would she do that? Apparently paper flowers or fake flowers weren't really that popular in gowns, but until the 1780s, but like there are like flowers on there and they might be silk. I ended up using paper flowers. Um, I found mine from Squish and Chips on Etsy. Uh, beautiful. Um, and they have Squish and Chips, which a lot of other sellers did not have, had the same flowers in different sizes. So they had 35 millimeter roses. They had 25 millimeter roses. They have 15 millimeter roses. So this meant that I could use a lot of different sizes. Cause if you look at the gown, she definitely has smaller roses up here and larger roses on the bottom. And she has multiple colors of roses. So you know how the roses are on there? They're glued. I used E6000 glue, you can yell at me, but I just couldn't think of a good way. I tried sewing them on and they really weren't sticking. Um, I tried using the wires of the roses, so nothing really worked. And I was I was like binge watching um, Anja Clayton's peacock dress making again, because I can watch that series forever. Um, and Angela Clayton just, you know, was talking about how she used E6000 glue. And I was like, wow, that looks really good. I should try that. And it really worked. I mean, I love this glue. I've used it for everything, like my badge clips and everything. And it really worked. So I just kind of put a little dab of glue in the back and put them on. And I used a little couple of plastic clips to keep them in place while they were dry drying overnight. And voila, they were done. That's what I did. Now for the shells, uh, if you look at them closely, they're bows and they have, they have little lines on them. They have um, stripes. And um, I looked for ages for a silk ribbon with stripes that even remotely look like that. And I couldn't find anything and certainly not in silk. So I was even willing to go with rayon or viscose or anything else if it looked similar. So I finally just gave up and decided to embroider my own. So to do that, I got some double faced silk douche, pale gold metallic thread, and then I stitched out the stripes. I did this um, again and again and again. I think, oh my God, I, I don't even know how many meters of this I made. I think I made at least about 12 meters of this. So I embroidered that on my um, Baby Lock Valiant. And once that was all embroidered, I pinked it and cut it out. And then after that, I made the bows and sewed the uh, bows onto the stomacher. And at this point, I was cutting it really close to the deadline because I was trying to finish this by a certain date so that I could meet my photographer and have professional photos of this taken. So um, I was rushing, so I apologize. I don't, I don't have that much that footage of me sewing it on, but I did make bows and I sewed those bows on and and I was done. Like that is the story of how I made the Madame du Pompadour robe à la Francaille. Um, now here's a video of me putting it on and explaining all the layers. Normally I start on the hair. In this case, I just put my hair into a simple bun because if you look at the original painting, her hair is actually quite simple. This isn't the time of big hair. This is 1755, not the 1770s. So now I start on the corset. I'm already wearing a shift underneath the corset. The shift is from handbound costumes because I really hate making shifts, period. The corset is from Red Threaded. This is their 1780s uh, whalebone stays. Again, these are technically stays. I have to say of all the corsets I've ever bought, these are hands down my favorite. Once it's laced up, I can get started. Now, on top of this, I will wear a set of pannier hoops. Uh, these are pocket hoops. They have slits on the side so that I could put water bottles and cell phones and everything in it. These I also did not make. You'll notice that it has two-lay netting on top of it, which is not historically accurate. However, the um, nylon netting, what it actually does is it fluffs it up so that those wires are not as easily visible from above. Nonetheless, because this taffeta, even though it is quite strong, has a tendency to show the wires, I put on another layer of linen petticoat that will help a lot to remove the look of the wires from the final look. 
So I tie that on from the first from the back and then from the front and then I just kind of fluff it up. I normally hate making petticoats, so I'm getting myself to make this petticoat for the sheer sake of removing lines, which are barely visible except in very rare photos, took me, believe it or not, three years of procrastination. You too can make underwear. I just hate making underwear, guys. I don't know what's wrong with me. But um, you'll notice that it has gives me that wonderful shape and everything has the slits so that I can still reach the ho uh, hoops and therefore the pockets. Then I put on the petticoat. This is my silk petticoat and I of course made it very obvious to see, show which side is the front and which side is the back. As normal, I lace up the back first and then the front. Of note, because 18th century skirts tie like this, I have to say, I can fit my petticoats from anything from a 22 inch waist to probably a 34 inch waist really comfortably without losing any of the shape. It's wonderful. And then I just kind of fluff it up, make sure that the it's all centered. You'll notice that the pleats are mostly at the side so that there's no pleats in the front to sort of take away. Then I put on the gown itself. If you look under the back, there is lacing so that I can uh, adjust the back as need be so that it could fit a much larger or smaller waist than my own. Then I actually lace up the front. You'll notice that there's these eyelets made of metal in the front and that is not really historically accurate. However, this was a suggestion from my JP Ryan pattern and I love it because what it does do is it sort of lines up the front perfectly every single time. Normally you don't have this. You have a wonderful ladies maid that would pin you into your dress. However, since I myself have no ladies maid, this make sure that everything is lined up even though I might be in a rush and may not have time to line everything up. So this just is, makes the dress nice and taut against my body. Once that's laced up, then I can put on my stomacher. Now my stomacher is quite floofy and believe it or not, it is put on with pins. Tiny little sucker. Um, it's just a little dress pin um, and I believe these are just sewing pins with metal ends. And uh, if you look at real 18th century uh, ones, they were actually rather large and thicker. Uh, I like these because they don't leave as big of a hole in the silk. And before you say anything, yes, um, I made my dress without robings. I don't really know if her gowns had robings or not. If you look at another one of her portraits, that one does not have robings, so I elected to make mine without. And then I was totally set to frolic and then I realized, wait a second, I'm missing something so important to this gown. And those are the enjambe or the white sleeve ruffles that go underneath my sleeves. And I think they add so much. But once that's on, it's on. I have to say, of like this is like my favorite thing to wear. I I love it so much. I'm really proud of the fact that it has the exact look that I want. It gives, still gives me the smooth sides. It really fits very well for me. And I love how generous those enjants are and how roughly the whole gown is. I could just drown in the ruffles in this gown. And it makes me so unbelievably happy to prance around in it. And of course, the first thing I did after I was done was I went for a photo shoot with Lindsay Hinderer. Mallory Harris did my hair and makeup. Thank you. 
anyways, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you had a great time. I know I did making this dress and sharing that journey with all of you. Um, I do post monthly. Please check at the end of every month or the beginning to see my next video. And thanks so much, guys.